Good day everyone, this is Chris with The Ancient Scholar. I hope you guys are uh, doing well. And today I would like to go on somewhat of a rant, if I may. I, um, one thing I often hear uh, among people of many different types of disciplines in life is the age-old question of why. Or how will this help me or affect me? Specifically, in regards to expensive science. Expensive science that has always gone on and is continuing to go on. And uh, obviously one of the big um, scientific projects that we have going on is the Large Hadron Collider. And as I've said in, in, in other videos, I'm not a physicist, I'm not a chemist. Um, I've had to take some physics, some chemistry, but uh, it's certainly not my uh, primary profession. Uh, but what I do in my profession, in, in healthcare, how I practice, what I do, how I change what I do, is all based upon the scientific method. Evidence-based medicine is nothing more than a way of using the scientific method <clears throat> to um, impact how medicine is practiced or healthcare is practiced. Okay, so um, I do have a, 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 a vetted interest in the scientific method, the scientific process, and I do take a bit of interest in people when they ask this question of why, how, and so on. So one of the questions among many that, that comes up is, well, how is a Large Hadron Collider going to help me? Why are we doing it? Why are we blowing all this money? How is this really going to affect anything? And the, the, the most concrete answer, the most logical answer I suppose I can give, is because there's no evidence right now, is I don't know. And you know, people are very uncomfortable with that answer. As a hum human beings, we are inherently curious. And we look to the physical world and the world around us to try to make sense of the world, the universe. And we are often not comfortable with unknowns. So perhaps to make the unknown a bit more comfortable, let's look back on history. Um, and look back on what has happened throughout history as we have added new knowledge, new ways of viewing the physical world. And if you're a student of history and you're a student and you look back on what's happened over and over, time and time and time again, you can see a very well-established pattern. Okay, So when we start thinking about um, formal language and mathematics, um, you know, this goes back at least as far as ancient Greek and ancient Roman culture and uh, societies. And what happened to humanity during that time period? Well, there was a... St we stepped out of the prehistory of, pre pre you know, um, you know, really the, the, the you know, the, the Babylonian, Mesopotamian um, empire started using language, and that really was more or less the end of prehistory. Okay, so we were no longer more or less unintelligent prehistoric creatures. Okay, we developed language, we developed mathematics, and what did that help us do? Well, we started making tools. We started to be more efficient at things like agriculture and settling and making and housing. Um, we advanced technologically. Our society advanced, and we started thinking about. Um, technical concepts, okay? And more or less what happened was a good thing for humanity, okay? And um, what happened when we stopped? And I'm generalizing a little bit. When we stopped thinking like that? Well, the Dark Ages is what happened, right? And um, the ancient, uh, not ancients at this point, but um, the, the Arabic and Persian scholars kind of had to take over 
and uh, take over advancing in mathematics and language and reason and philosophy while um, the, the European Dark Ages were going on. And what happened uh, right around 1100 or so? When, um, you know, the ancient Islamic or the, the older Islamic cultures quit believing in this scientific method, if you will. They quit using it. Well, pretty much what we have going on today in, 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 some, in some respect. Um, you know, they, they quit advancing technologically and scientifically, those, those countries. And then what happened is they quit and we had the, the European Renaissance, right? The Age of Enlightenment, where we went, once again, went back to looking at the world and the universe in a, in a, in a quote-unquote scientific way. And uh, what happened? We had Isaac Newton, we, have, we had Huygens, we had um, all of these um, scientists, if you will, um, up until the turn of the century. You know, the late 1800s and 1900s, we had you know, working theories of electricity and magnetism. You know, before 1900, quantum mechanics started, um, and the quantum revolution occurred, and that brings us to, what, the mid-1920s when the, the Schrodinger equation came out, the uncertainty principle came out, and in 1925, 1926, we actually had some sort of working theory working theories of the universe as a whole, okay? We had classical mechanics, we had relativity, and we had quantum mechanics, okay? We had the foundation in place. And I suppose there were people back in that time, and, and mind you, you know, we, we, were, we were, you know, just coming, you know, we were well established in the Industrial Revolution, but that's as far as we've gone. So for the most part, a lot of what went on, at least in the United States, was there was a lot of agriculture, a lot of farming. You know, there, there weren't um, the, there wasn't, um, it was just a very different country, obviously, back then. And I imagine there were a lot of people back then that even, it may be that a lot of people didn't even hear about this, first of all, you know, because we you know, had world wars going on and so on and so forth. But there were, you know, probably a lot of people that said the exact same thing then as there are people that are saying and asking the same questions now. How is this going to help? And um, so let's take, you know, 1925. Um, the Schrodinger equation, boom, comes out. Guess what? We, we can now, we have a reasonably good idea of what's going on in the hydrogen atom. And, you know, subsequently, you know, that went proliferated throughout chemistry and the different approximations of, you know, brought us to where we are now. Um, let's say that I were to walk around in, you know, the, the early, the 1925, 1926, and I were to have one of these with me here. Hmm? The iPhone, right? Look at that. Cool. What do you think the people of that time would have thought about me? There would have been some really irrational um, ways of looking at it, right? This, and, and, and you know, you, you've, you've all heard the quote that any sufficiently advanced technology to a sufficiently non-advanced culture is going to appear to be magic, and a lot of people would probably think that this exceptionally powerful computer was magic, okay? Even 15, 20 years ago, when I was younger, had someone had something like this, I, you know, what would have I, I have thought? I don't know. Um, I can tell you the types of computers I was using um, back then, and um, the this iPhone is orders of magnitude orders of magnitude look at that somebody said something on my Facebook account just like that you know um, orders of magnitude more powerful than the most powerful computers that existed at that time okay 
Uh, I remember when I was, this is in the mid-1990s, when the MMX, the Multimedia Expansion Pentium chip came out. 233 megahertz of raw power was going to revolutionize the world. What kind of processor do I have in this? What, a gigahertz processor? Uh, 16 gigabytes of memory? Non-volatile memory? Flash memory? No, uh... No, no radial drive? I guess the point I'm trying to get is nobody in the 1920s could have ever predicted that from quantum mechanics, from, hooray, we have some sort of understanding of what's going on in a hydrogen atom, from there to 2012, well, this, this, this is what, a year, this is a couple years old, this is the 4, this is even the 4S. I'm due for an upgrade next month, by the way, so we'll see how that goes. <laughs> um, never could they have imagined, probably, something like this existed. Well, there were people that imagined, and there were authors that wrote, you know, all these incredible things, but th the average person would have never anticipated that a, a human being could walk around, that the ancient scholar could contact his wife in Afghanistan, and his wife could tell him, hey, uh, five RPGs landed on the base where I'm at today, but I'm okay. I'm okay. Okay. Never in a hundred years, probably, would people have been able to imagine that this would exist. And I could blather on and on, but the ultimate point is, if we look back at history, the ancients could never have imagined, for the most part, where their rudimentary thoughts about mathematics and even philosophy, uh, Epicureanism, Hedonism, all of these different types of philosophy, where all of that would ultimately end up thousands of years later, okay? So the ultimate answer is, I don't know, but looking back on history, I can tell you this, you don't even know. You don't even know where that, that well-invested money, in my humble opinion, is going to take us in the next few decades. You don't even know. I don't even know, but I, I, I can imagine. And I can look at this, this iPhone or an Android or whatever, okay? And I can look at things like quantum tunneling, right? Electrons tunneling through supposedly um, impervious barriers. Well, that's one of the principles behind flash memory in this thing. Do you think anyone could have imagined where that concept of quantum tunneling would have taken us? Where uh, magnetic resonance, nuclear magnetic resonance imaging and MRI of atoms, where that would have taken us? Where we could look at an ankle, we could find torn ligaments, we could find tumors. What, what, do you think Dirac when he um, came up with the, the, the concept of an antiparticle, you think Dirac thought, hey, I bet, I bet we could use that, that positron and, and you know, we could uh, inject uh, sugars laced with radioisotopes and they decay and release um, these positrons that would you know, hit regular matter and it'd, make a, it'd de demolish each other and release light and that light could be detected and, and that would be a, a PET scan and we could find cancer. Right? We, could, we could see somebody with what's Hodgkin's lymphoma, we, could, we can see, without having to open them up, how well they're responding to the chemotherapy. No. But here we are nonetheless. Here we are nonetheless. So that's kind of my whole point. It's kind of a maybe pointless rambling to some, but I really wanted to address a lot of these questions that I hear. Um, and again, I am not a scientist, okay? I am not on the cutting edge of research and math and physics and chemistry and all that. I'm a pretty average guy with a pretty average intelligence with a fairly average level of education when compared to most of the people in the United States, okay? So I'm nothing special, and I can see just the potential of where some of this can take us. So um, hopefully you guys enjoyed that rambling, and hopefully it was somewhat enlightening. Okay, guys, as always, thanks for hanging in there.